A discussion around a recent report that NAPA put out about the possibility of reforming uh, the federal civil service. Uh, and both of these two gentlemen were members of the, of the team that conducted that um, analysis. So on my left, your right, is uh, a faculty member in the Glenn College. Uh, his his um, background is as a historian, um, a, a student of public administration from way, way back. Um, in fact, right now he was telling me that it dates back to monkeys. Um, so, uh, or now, now he's told me that, that story before. Um, but it's on the Magna Carta. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, Yos is a longtime student of the history of how we govern and organize to govern. Um, and he serves as the associate dean for faculty development in the Glenn College um, and was a now. The timeline of civil service reform, sorry, I started in antiquity 5,000 years ago. <laughs> put it in one page, put it in one page, seriously, right? And then said, well, here's the timeline. I sent it to everyone, and it was politely ignored. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine, because the timeline that's really relevant is, of course, that from 1945 on, uh, which I could have done too, but yeah, with more detail. But you all are familiar with the picture of the you know, evolution, the start with the primordial ooze, and then you've got the caveman, and then us. With civil service reform, it's still caveman. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're trying to do something like, right? Okay. Now, the civil service as we know it today, in the Western world especially, exists for some 130, 140 years in the United States. In Europe, Western Europe, about 180 years, right? And civil service systems start to grow, personnel systems, really fast in response to what I call in class, Russia, the triple whammy, right? The uh, combined effect of industrialization, urbanization, and uh, rapid population growth from the 1870s on, uh, tripling, quadrupling, uh, many times over, actually the size of cities in the United States. And when these people came from the countryside into the cities, because that's where the jobs were, both in Europe as well as in North America, agriculture was in crisis, there were serious droughts. Where do you go if you want to have food on the table for your kids? You go to the cities, to the factory jobs. So, <clears throat> here people come to these cities, Detroit, Pittsburgh, they're really bursting out of their seams. And what we experienced here in the United States and in Western Europe is what China and South Korea are experiencing in the past 40 years. It's the same thing. And lo and behold, a study of public administration emerges in that context. Why? Because we actually need public servants who know what they're talking about. That they write regulation on issues that they have been trained for in a, in a degree in agriculture or in dietary uh, studies or in English. Yeah? It doesn't really matter. Whatever degree you can study, there's someone in government who has that degree who will write the regulation that is relevant to uh, the population at large. So, why does the civil service grow so fast? Because people in smaller communities manage to meet collective challenges as a community of people. Local governments generally are pretty small. But if you go to a place where no one knows each other anymore, and heck, it has happened in Amsterdam, I know it happened in New York, that you can actually die next door, and then maybe after three years, so three weeks, people start complaining about the smell, right? So where do you turn to if you have issues with garbage collection, with sewage system, with water supply, housing quality, you name it. It wasn't easy to be a city manager in the 1880s. It was really not easy. And from research in Europe, in the Netherlands and in France, we know, and I suspect it was the same in the United States, that people, individual citizens, wrote their city manager, their mayors, their council members, can you do something about this? Issues that before they had done among themselves, <clears throat> right? So, <clears throat> civil service, in retrospect, when I look back, I don't want to live in the 1870s, I think they're doing actually pretty darn great. Yeah? And there's a lot of critique about the civil service and about government in general, and it's basically stereotypes. <coughs> People think in terms of stereotypes, and I do the same thing. We're all subject to those biases that Daniel Kahneman got his uh, Nobel Prize for, right, in 2002. But um, they're doing actually a really great job, which is why it is so important that we study them, not only, but that we try to make it better 
and make it make it a better fit for the kind of challenges that society has now. The last 30 years, there has been a serious burden across the Western world to make these civil service systems better and fit for our current challenges, right? And it's all, you could summarize it on the having of new public management. And I will not uh, bore you with all sorts of details, but it is actually a very, very one-sided way of thinking about reforming a public service, right? And it was summarized by the OECD in a report in 1995 that civil service reforms never concern functions of the state and are always focused on processes of personnel management. Isn't it the case that people, <coughs> that we reform a system in terms of thinking about what functions that system has? And I didn't realize that when we were working on that panel, that one of those three legs that you're going to say something about, I suspect, mission has everything to do with the substance of the work that is being done and that you tailor your civil service to that and make it a flexible civil service actually a civil service uh, where you can hire experts uh, at a salary maybe not the same as the market can offer in the private sector but at a reasonable salary right? anyway npm the word or what you said the conclusions are not out yet but there's one empirical study uh, you remember NPM, right? Uh, a government that works better and costs less. I've never heard of such a thing. How can you, <laughs> with less money, do something better? It's ridiculous. I mean, it is just ridiculous, right? Well, that was a nice book from Chris Hood, a friend of mine at All Souls College in Oxford, together with Ruth Dix in 2015. A government that works better and costs less? Question mark. And he investigates empirically what has 20 years of government reform done well. If you flip to the end, the summary of that book, it is a government that works a little less well and costs a little more. <laughs> I'll turn over to Ron. Okay. So I'm going to try to make the history of civil service reform in the United States exciting, uh, not very. Uh, but I think there are two themes that you should think about tonight. One is complexity and sort of the other side of that coin, the talent to deal with that complexity. Um, the last great effort at reforming the civil service in the United States was in 1978. Uh, almost this entire room wasn't even born then. Uh, but if you think about what government looked like in 1978, American government, it was still pretty much monolithic, one size fits all, very bureaucratic. Uh, the founding fathers had never envisioned a civil service um, like uh, the one that exists today or the one that existed in 1978. It's not even in any of our founding documents. But as government grew more and more and more complex, uh, it realized government doesn't change very quickly or very readily. Because um, if you look at the model, uh, I think the, the government still assumes one size fits all, one set of rules. And what we've seen since 1978, and I'll plead guilty to being uh, part of the revolution here, was more and more agencies essentially seceding from that union, cutting their own deal with Congress, going their own separate way. And um, the nature and character of the U.S. Civil Service changed in the process, not by design, but by default. Uh, so if you look today, we probably have a couple of dozen different civil service systems. And I'll point out a couple of examples that deal with uh, the issues that Yoss um, <coughs> described. Uh, the banking regulation industry, like SEC, cannot possibly compete for the talent, uh, talent um, that, um, uh, that's on Wall Street. Economists and attorneys and accountants that get seven-figure salaries. They're not going to come to work for the government. Um, so SEC and the rest of the banking regulation industry uh, uh, agencies seceded from the union. They have their own set of personnel rules. Intelligence community did the same for different reasons. The DOD laboratories did the same. The DOD acquisition community has done the same. VA has done it a little bit, not as much as they'd like. But right now, uh, the federal civil service is no longer one size fits all. It looks like a gerrymandered set of congressional districts. A crazy quilt. And that does get in the way of mission, and I won't bore you with a discussion about that, 
suffice to say, again, that was more by default than design. Every agency going to the Hill and cutting their own de deal, saying, we need, we're special, so we need special treatment. Uh, I actually have done that um, in four separate agencies, in DOD, in the Internal Revenue Service, in the Department of Homeland Security, and later the Intelligence Community. When you total all of those agencies up, that's well over half of the civil service operating under various uh, versions of their own sets of rules. But again, nobody designed it that way. So that was the purpose of our paper. And I think it's mainly a case of theory catching up with reality. Uh, so you also mentioned three pillars. That's our architecture. Uh, that's the, um, that's the um, formula we recommend for essentially embracing what has become reality, uh, this set of customized civil service systems, but not by default, make it by design. Call it intelligent design, if you will. Um, here are the three pillars. Uh, first, mission. Uh, that's the reason all of these agencies have broken away from that uh, one-size-fits-all civil service system. Their missions are different. They compete for different kinds of talent. Uh, engineers, scientists, doctors, nurses, you name it, they all compete for different things, different ways, in different labor markets. And they all need their own set of customized rules to be able to do that. So you could easily argue, and in some cases we did, that um, we should just abandon the, the notion of a, uh, a civil service system, a United States civil service system and just surrender to the fact that we're going to have a set of systems. Call it subsystem or a system of systems. Um, but the essential character of uh, the civil service system gets lost in that process. So that's our second pillar. While we said mission first, an agency should, as they have been doing, uh, be permitted some considerable flexibility to customize the rules that apply to their employees. Uh, tailored to their own particular uh, mission needs. There still needs to be some glue that binds them all together. In the past, that glue was a set of rules. Everybody played by the same rules. That became intolerable. Uh, so we said, that's not going to work. What else can we use to glue um, the system of systems together? And we'll go back to some of the uh, principles that founded the American civil service system. Things like merit and non-discrimination and veterans' preference and neutral competence. And um, we what, what we described in the white paper is an inherent tension between mission first, customized systems on one hand, and a set of principles that we believe should apply to everybody. Those principles may be operationalized differently. The de definition of merit in the CIA may be different than the definition of merit in VA. The rules to realize that principle may differ in those two agencies, but they all still ought to conform to that principle. Now, that's not an easy thing. It's much easier to write a bunch of rules and say everybody has to follow them. But again, we've seen the result of that over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and I, my, my personal view is we will never, ever, ever again see the sort of big bang um, approach to civil service reform that we saw in 1978. Instead, we've seen a whole series of individual agency-based reforms, again, um, all happening uh, according to uh, the political calculus of the moment and not by some grand intelligent design. So the paper represents that intelligent design. Mission first on one hand, customized systems, core principles on the other hand, to glue the system together, but the inherent tension has to be managed, and that's the third pillar. Um, a set of governance and accountability mechanisms that balances the tension. Uh, I think ultimately we agreed that that tension is healthy. That agencies should struggle, uh, and central management agencies as well, should struggle between how much flexibility and discretion an agency has versus how much they must conform to the core principles. Let them resolve that tendency, that, that tension, and create a governance structure that tries to strike a balance to make sure that they're accountable to the mission on one hand and the taxpayers and constituents that um, depend on that mission for goods and services and other things 
from the federal government. So make sure that they pay attention to that mission, but also at the same time, pay attention to those core principles. We frankly couldn't reach agreement on uh, what that governance and accountability mechanism uh, would look like. Is it OPM, today's Central Management Agency? I'm uh, an alum of OPM, and I was one of the strongest voices saying, no, OPM is great as a rule writer, but they're not great at resolving and reconciling that tension because all of those, almost every one of those agency efforts to break out of the core system uh, was opposed by OPM. Uh, and uh, its credibility in terms of being the balancing act, the fulcrum, I think is relatively low. It pains me to say that because, again, I was uh, associate director at OPM, in, on the org chart at least, third in command, uh, but uh, not really suited to it. Is it OMB? Uh, some would argue, and uh, I won't be quoted publicly since we're on Facebook, but some would argue OMB would be worse the origin of some of the draconian budget proposals that we're seeing that would, uh, by word no one else's, emasculate uh, parts of the civil service like health benefits and retirement, cornerstones of our model. Uh, those originated from OMB. Whether they'll pass or not remains to be seen. But while OMB certainly has a strategic perspective, uh, it's not clear that they would be as strong an advocate of civil service principles and civil servants as OPM is. So, you know, those two candidates may not apply. Um, a third option was something called the President's Management Council, the deputy secretaries of all of the uh, executive departments and agencies, as individuals who on one hand are political appointees and are there to um, pursue the agenda of the administration, but they also have to worry about the morale and welfare of their workforces and their missions. And in them, they may embody that tension that we've talked about. So that's the model we proposed. Don't hold your breath about uh, that model coming to pass, because as um, our, the uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, the first Volcker Commission, which um, uh, was uh, created in 1989, recommended that model, and no one paid any attention to them. Uh, they actually funded my PhD dissertation, and I had something to do with their recommendations and. They were wonderful recommendations, but they were ignored. Um, two of the four authors, uh, two, two of the five panel members for the NAPA report, uh, Don Kell and myself, were actually co-authors of a book that Brookings published in 1996 that recommended the same model, and nobody paid any attention to it. Um, so you have to ask, is the uh, environment right and ripe for somebody to pay attention to this report? Um, uh, we hope so because uh, the situation is becoming untenable and many of these agencies that don't have the ability to customize their systems, um, they're all up on the hill asking for permission to do so. And I'm hopeful that um, somebody, whether it's the Hill or the administration or career civil servants, will um, work to bring some coherence to the system. Uh, but coherence not in the form of one size fits all or the opposite extreme, everybody do their own thing but this tension between mission and principle balanced by a fulcrum of accountability. Okay. Great. Terry. Okay. So we have to stand in the middle, right? Um, so as, as Josh said when he introduced me, I spent 20 years in the military on active duty, but I also spent 12 years as a senior executive. I spent about eight years as a career senior executive in the Department of Defense, and then I spent almost four years as a political appointee in the Department of Labor. So I've been in multiple personnel systems, and as Ron says, they're all different. Um, but Ron alluded to a point there at the end about why do this report now? Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background about why bring yet another report to, to the people. Um, Paul Verkeil, who was really the creator of the, the demand for the report, um, is a prominent academic in this space, but he also was the former chair of the um, uh, American Administrative Conference. Administrative Conference of the United States. Um, and so they had done a lot of work in terms of identifying things that needed to change in the civil service. But what he hadn't seen was a report that really provided a new framework for organizing the civil service. And you still see that today. There are a lot of 
good government groups in the personnel reform business, and there are a lot of tactical proposals for changes around the edges, whether that is a change to the payment, uh, to the pay system, or a change to the retirement system, or a change in um, the ability to hire and fire people, all sort of around the edges, but none of them really got to framing a new way of thinking about the civil service. And so that's one of the reasons the Academy is so proud of this report, is we feel like we've created a new jumping off point for conversation now about what really is possible with civil service reform. Not just a change to the GS schedule, but something really much more fundamental. Um, and these two and the rest of the panel were very uh, instrumental in that. And we also have Thelma Harris, who was the, the project lead um, in terms of the team that actually did uh, the support work for the panel. So you've got a lot of folks here who have that experience. Um, one of the things that I think, in addition to the three-legged stool, that's been, it's very interesting in the report is an itemization of kind of 10 threats, 10, uh, 10 environmental factors that really are driving a change, the need to change the civil service. Um, and one that certainly I have personal experience with and we talk a lot about as we talk about the future of public service is the idea of co-production in your um, government solutions. Very few of the situations that we face now can be resolved by a single agency. Um, and just as an example, my portfolio at Labor was Veterans Employment. Well, Department of Labor has a lot to do with employment uh, all across the country. Um, and so they know all, about all kinds of programs, but they're not the only ones who deal with veteran unemployment. The VA has a big part in it, the Department of Defense has a big part of it, and as you start to, to look around, almost every single federal agency has a veteran employment program or receives appropriation for training for veterans. So what we found is we were really trying to develop an effective solution back when veteran unemployment was at nine and 10%, was that we couldn't just do it with the, the typical three that we knew to get around the table with labor and VA and DOD. We had to get the Department of Education. We had to get the Small Business Administration. We had to get the Department of Transportation. We had to get the Department of Energy all around the table to really be able to craft uh, an effective intergovernmental solution. And so when we think about not only do agencies need to have the flexibility to hire people that fit with their mission in a way that fits with their mission. But we also need to bring, bring, be bringing folks into civil service who have the capacity and the interest to be um, boundary spanners, who can think beyond just their own agency and know who to get to the table to be willing and able to work with others to craft these um, integrative solutions that are so important to, to going uh, farther in, in the future and being able to really make government work. So just as a thought, that's kind of how we got here and some of the situations and the issues that we're trying to get after as we propose a new framework for dealing with civil service reform. And I, look, and I, for the record, I'm, I, I don't want to suggest that I was only being facetious about here we go again. Uh, I think um, in, in what's different from the first local report and the second and the third and the Brookings book and others is the acknowledgement that um, this tension is actually healthy. Don't try to suppress it with one approach or the other, but recognize that the tension is actually a good thing. Uh, but as Terry mentioned, this has been a pendulum. We went from one size fits all to everybody doing its own thing and found in all kinds of cases, uh, VA is one example, my last government job was as chief of HR for the intelligence community, 17 agencies, with seven different personnel systems. And the idea of them working together was antithetical for all kinds of reasons, but I will tell you that one of them was that they all had different rules, different ways of rewarding, of paying, of hiring, and so it was, like, it was no wonder they couldn't talk to one another. So it's that tension between differentiation on one hand and integration on the other. And I think that's the real value of this report, is to say you need both, they're both good, you need to come up with a mechanism that makes sure that that tension doesn't get out of hand. That's for our second report. Yeah. And it's really important that something is being done for and about the Federal Civil Service uh, because the first time I saw that was before I had moved to the United States. People were wondering what's going to happen uh, with hiring because people from the baby boom generation are going to retire. And that the first time I read this was in 1996. 
And guess what? They're yeah, still talking about, oh my word, 2022, how much was it, 50%? Yeah. I mean, this is a good moment to think about uh, reforming civil service, because there, civil service, because there's a whole uh, <coughs> generation of new young people well, well, coming in. And I will add, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not so much the retirement eligibility, that's important, 65% mm -hmm. or something in five years. It's the other side of the equation. Uh, the government share of the millennial and post-millennial workforce yeah. is in the low single digits. Six percent. Six percent. That's what um, a third or a fourth of what of the segment they represent in the labor market. So we're not bringing in new talent, and other, uh, all the other talent is getting old, like me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a good moment to move into the process of such a white paper, and I thought that might be interesting for especially students. Or for people who are not in, uh, involved with NAPA, uh, yeah, it's a different way of working. I mean, I've collaborated with lots of people. You have, you have, but uh, put pr uh, ac academics and practitioners together. And an academic like me, yeah, I think about book stuff, I suppose, and concepts and theories, which you do. Too. I mean, yeah. but yeah, 39 years, I can't beat that. Uh, this thing is federal civil service. I um, started when I was 12. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I started when I was 12. Age 12. <laughs> um, so I come up with all sorts of ideas in our discussions in the panel you know, that are maybe too radical. Right? One thing that I, as a um, resident alien, uh, regard as at least peculiar to say the least is the number of layers, hierarchical layers, in between the top executive and the career civil service. I don't think there's any Western country where you have up to 16 layers between the top executive and the career civil service. I mean, the lines of communication between the secretary of a department yeah, and the career civil service, the people who actually know what they're talking about. I'm not saying that political appointees don't. There, I'm sure there are good ones. But their turnover is worth 14 months, 16 months. I mean, by the time you get to understand the place, you move on to another CV building experience. I suppose. No, like but, somebody's played the game where you whisper in her ear or something and she whispers it in her ear yeah. and by the time it gets to the end it's unintelligible. Yeah. That's government. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't be too hard on it. It's actually doing its best and it's doing a pretty good job if you think about the challenges they faced over the years. Anyway, um, so political appointees, but that was not subject for discussion. This is a different political administrative system than those continental European ones. But if we want to reform the civil service, that would be my pick. So Americans don't make me president. Because that is one thing I would really go for very quickly. Contractors, I assume, we said something in our white paper about contractors. Uh, one thing that I didn't know, that I learned from uh, meetings in our panel, is that uh, in the United States military, right after the Second World War, the ratio of military contractor was seven military, one contractor. The last 10 years is one on one. Now, guess what? Who is going to oversee these contractors? Civil service. Yes. And do they have the capacity to do that? No. Exactly.